Okay. Well, so uh, next speaker is uh, Horacio Casini from Bariloche, and he will speak about uh, facets of QFT entropy coin. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, I, I thank the organizers for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I will talk about um, facets of the quantum field theory entropy cone. Uh, this is based on two papers, recent papers of this year with uh, Eduardo Testé and Gonzalo Torroba. This is about relations of um, strong subadditivity of entropy with unitarity bounds in, in conformal field theory. <clears throat> and the second one is about a model for the entropy um, that uh, we, we ask if this corresponds to some particular quantum field theory or, or not. So this is somehow my uh, ideological uh, transparency to start with. Uh, the question is the measures of information in quantum field theory, how do they fit in the greater scheme of quantum field theory? <clears throat> then you have a, the usual formulation in terms of quantum fields of quantum field theory. Uh, and it's, it's very old result that this formulation can be also uh, translated in a formulation about some functions or distributions that are just expectation values of products of operators, the Whitman formulation in the 50s, the Euclidean formulation, etc. And it's well known that this formulation <clears throat> is equivalent to the quantum field theory formulation. So you can extract from these numbers, you can extract the, the Hilbert space and the, the operators. And it also, it helps you in a deriving or proposing a dynamical principle, the path integral, where you can produce models out of a classical action. <clears throat> On the other hand, we also have this quite old formulation of algebraic quantum field theory by Hagen Castle in the 64, <clears throat> where you describe the theory in terms of operator algebras attached to space-time regions. It's somehow a, a basis independent formulations in the sense that <clears throat> it doesn't point to some particular fields. You, you have all the, the let's, say, let's say, the operators generated by the, those fields inside the, the, the algebra. So the question uh, is, is how to do the same step here, just to take some numbers, and, um, because in principle, uh, <clears throat> this formulation <clears throat> is, at least for us uh, physicists, is quite difficult to, to grasp or to work with. Uh, you have these von Neumann algebras, and then what we would like to say, well, let us talk about numbers, so you would, like to have numbers attached to the algebras. And if you think a little bit, uh, in, in this case, this, these numbers are, are just statistical measures of the fluctuations of the vacuum state in the fields. And the analogous quantity here would be a statistical measures of the fluctuation of the vacuum in the algebra. And this naturally goes to entanglement entropy or things com computed out of entanglement entropy mutual information, for example, or other quantities like uh, range entropies, etc. So in this scheme, the natural question is whether there is a universal description of quantum field theory in terms of vacuum entanglement entropy. And if this is the case, uh, what are the axioms, uh, how to reconstruct the theory, etc. So uh, I will talk about uh, these, these things, but uh, only a very, very little thing I will, I will display today. So uh, it's very, very, uh, let's say green, this project, uh, very far from any, uh, any full achievement. So the first thing is that um, uh, the entropy is, is ill-defined. We know that the entanglement entropy is ill-defined. It has divergences. Uh, you can compute it if you have a cutoff in the theory, but uh, it, this is not a real problem because you can compute this other quantity that is a combination of entropies. Uh, you have two regions that are disjoint, A and B, 
and you compute the mutual information. This is well defined. This can be also defined mathematically without any any um, uh, intermediate step where you compute the entropy. So uh, I will ma mainly talk about mutual information in this talk. <clears throat> and then the question is why uh, one can think that this is that it is possible to extract the full information of the theory out of the mutual information, for example, of two algebras. Uh, and there are hints that this is possible. One of the hints is that if you take a conformal field theory, uh, the conformal field theory is um, determined by the CFT data that are the scaling dimensions and the OP coefficients of the operators. These are numbers. And it seems that they are extractable from the mutual information in an expansion at long distances. If you take A and B very far away, you, you can see that uh, the mutual information um, falls with a, some power. And this power tells you about the lowest dimension of in the theory, in the conformal field theory. But in fact, you can have a, a full power expansion here uh, and all the coefficients of this expansion give you different, different um, uh, conformal dimensions of different operators of the theory. And you can also play the game of computing other things. For example, here is, is some quantity that is called a tripartite information of three regions. And you, you can see the appearance of, of, the, um, of the, the operator product expansion coefficients here, in, in this case, in three scalars. So the data, it seems to be there in the entropy. <clears throat> uh, and at least uh, for conformal field theory, it seems you can, in principle, recover the, 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 full, the full data. And another hint that this may be possible is looking at the range entropies of integer order. The range entropies of integer order are quite special quantities because they they look like um, uh, statistical quantities as entropies, but they are also related to expectation values of operator. And the idea is that uh, you, if you have a cutoff, you, you take the trace of row to the n, and this is um, a statistical measure of the density matrix. And this is, in fact, expectation values of an, of one of an operator that is called, let's say, rangy twist operator in the region. Um, the the range entropy is computed oh here there is a log here so it's, the range entropy is uh, some number times the log of the trace of row to the n and with this range entropy you can compute something similar to the mutual information that we call the range mutual information that is also free from divergences and in principle well defined but this thing is it then looks like a correlator of these operators these twist operators. Um, and, and then it has the, the properties of positivity of operators that the, the operators have. In particular, you can, <clears throat> uh, you can take uh, regions. You, ha you have a, double, a wedge here, a right wedge, the left wedge. You can take regions in one side. You can do uh, CR, CRT reflection and then the the usual pr properties of positivity of operators based on Tomita Takesaki theory tells you that um, these range entropies will satisfy uh, el, um, an infinite tower of inequalities that are given by these determinants. They are just saying that these, these traces of row to the end are just expectation values of operators. And then in principle, uh, with the, the, then the range entropies have uh, this, um, this large amount of inequalities from which in principle you can think you can recover the Hilbert space as it is done in, um, in the Weidman reconstruction theorem. Um, I have to say this is not mathematically developed and also that I will not follow the route that seems, uh, that seems the natural one, but uh, I will, I will instead talk about the entropy, which is the case where you extend analytically this n to n equal to one. So in that case, the inequalities are lost. These inequalities are lost. Whenever n is not an integer, you can define the range entropies 
but the, the, you don't have these inequalities that only hold for an integer. Um, and, and then when you get to n equal to one, you have the entropy and these inequalities are lost, but you have another inequality that appears there that is this strong superadditivity inequality. So I will explore uh, the, this, this other inequality and the mutual information rather than the uh, range entropies. So um, what do we know about the mutual information uh, in quantum field theory? Well, very, very little. And I have listed here some things that we know. Um, as I want to talk about the mutual information on the entropy, I'm forced to introduce this other quantity that is a tripartite information. That is a combination of mutual informations that is, um, is, is basically measuring how non-extensive is the mutual information in one of the entries. Uh, and then these are hands on how the, the things that we know that the mutual information is positive, that the mutual information is monotonic, monotonic increasing with the size of the two regions. And these are symmetric properties. The mutual information is symmetric in the two, in, in the two uh, indices, the two entries. And the tripartite information is symmetric, completely symmetric in the three, in the three um, entries. These two properties just come from the fact that uh, these quantities can be written in terms of the entropy and then it's, it's trivial, these properties are trivial. Somehow uh, behind these properties uh, is the fact that they are uh, entropy combinations. Well, this is just Poincare invariance, uh, clustering, um, normal things in quantum field theory. And then you have also this other property that is a Markov property that I will use and describe later. So I, I will not spend time now uh, explaining this. And you have also, in, in principle, you have this idea that when the mutual information, that when the two regions come to be near to each other, the, the boundaries of the two regions are near to each other, you have a divergence or increasing the mutual information without bound uh, and increases like the area term. It's, it's like the area of the shared boundary. And this is important if you want to describe theories in dimension D uh, and not theories that are uh, obtained by dimensional reduction. So, uh, and we, we can see here that uh, in a striking contrast with the case of range entropies, we have very few inequalities. It's just this monotonicity thing and the positivity uh, and that's it. So, and also all is linear, all, all the things are linear. So the solutions of this, um, of this set of, 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 of axioms, let's say, uh, form a cone that we call quantum field theory entropy cone. Uh, the sum of solutions naturally is a solution because they correspond to product or independent theories. So the entropies just add up in the case of independent theories, the, the, so there is no mystery there, but the solutions all allow also for a scaling limit. So I can multiply by a positive constant and it's also a solution. And that is not necessarily expected. For example, in the case of the range entropies, these inequalities, of course, are obeyed if you have a sum of two independent uh, range entropies, but you cannot scale the range entropies and expect that these inequalities uh, are obeyed uh, still. So this is probably a lack of knowledge of, of our knowledge of the mutual information that we don't have any non-linearity in this, in this set of, uh, of requirements. Um, so even though that these are very uh, few inequalities, et cetera, is still very powerful. Uh, it's not easy to find examples, uh, just trying to construct them geometrically. Um, uh, in, in particular, these, these quantities, these, these properties by the normalization group irreversibility theorems for dimension two, three, and four, but not for higher dimensions. Um, and I, uh, my talk will be, uh, will be about the fact that these requirements imply unitarity bounds, some unitarity bounds for conformal field theories. And also I will show that this set of actions are ultimately incomplete. 
So uh, this is my, my first topic, uh, how unitarity bounds uh, come from a strong subadditivity of the entropy. Well, <clears throat> uh, for that, I will use this Markov property for a, for a conformal field theory. From now on, I will talk mainly about conformal field theories. So you take uh, two regions, A and B. One of the regions live uh, with a boundary in a null cone, in the, and the other one uh, uh, we will take also in the in, in null cone, but you can take anything here. And then <clears throat> uh, we, we know that the entropies of regions with boundaries in a null cone satisfies something that is called the Markov property, that is the saturation of strong subjectivity, that is the entropy of A1, let's say, plus the entropy of A2 is equal to the entropy of intersection plus the entropy of the union. Um, this is a cutoff uh, independent statement in the sense that all the boundaries appear in both sides, so divergence is canceled here, but in order to better um, write this as a cutoff independent thing, you can compute this same combination for the mutual information with a fixed region B. And then it turns out that the combination, in the combination, this, of course, this part of the mutual information corresponding to the entropy of the re first region cancel out. The second one is kept fixed, cancel out. And then you get something that is, again, positive because of a strong subadditivity. So, at the end, what you get is that the uh, is a, the property that is called strong superadditivity of mutual information. That is, is a kind of combination of entropies of regions in a null in a null cone of mutual information in, in, with with one region in a null cone is always positive. Well, and then we will try to use this to understand some inequalities for large distance and long distances between A's and, and B's here. So in a, in a conformal field theory, in a conformal field theory, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's natural to take the, the regions as two spheres that can be boosted to each other. So we describe this, these two spheres in space time, the causal shadows of them with uh, the four points of the tips of the double cones. If this is a four point, point quantity. And in conformal field theory, a four point quantity depends on the cross ratios of these four uh, points. And here you have two, two possible cross ratios that you can construct out of these four points. So this mutual information will be a function of, of these two numbers, let's say. Um, for, long, uh, for long distances, you can expand these quantities for long distances between the two spheres, and you get uh, an expansion like this. The, the possibilities, the, this, the fact that there are, there are two numbers, two degrees of freedom, are reflected in the fact that you have two possibilities, let's say, for the leading term. One is a power of... Um, of, uh, of this combination of distances. These are the radius of the spheres and this is the, the separating distances. There is a power there. And you also have a possible um, tensorial structure that is again a power of this quantity, the always the same quantity, it's always positive. This is kind of a boost parameter, uh, a relative boost parameter between the two spheres. So N1 and N2 are the directions of, uh, of, the, of the null cones, and L is the direction of the separating distance. And in general, and we will see examples where you, you in general have, uh, for the leading term, some specific power where L, where, where, where L is very large. Uh, so this number is, is small. And then you can have a combination of this type of terms for different case. <clears throat> so uh, then you you would uh, you you can um, play the game of computing this inequality that I talk about for these conformal field theories at long distances, and for a specific term, you what you get is this inequality here. So you can you you have to do 
this um, as a limit, you have to take many uh, spheres that are rotated in such a way that the, applying this, the inequality multiple times, the, um, the limits of the intersections and unions that are not spheres go to spheres. And as the mutual information is a smooth quantity, uh, it, they, they converge to spheres. So at the end, you have uh, inequality between spheres, originally spheres, and finally spheres. So uh, you just apply the formula and get this inequality. And this inequality have, a, have two terms with different power here in this boost parameter. And just taking the boost parameter very large, this term will dominate the inequality. It means that the coefficient has to be positive. And then you obtain this, uh, this inequality here that tells you that the conformal dimension or of the, the power in, the, in your mutual information expansion has to be greater than this number that is related to, um, to the tensor power here and the dimension of space time. Uh, we will see that this is related to unitarity bounds for free fields. So uh, more, more concretely, it's, it's a unitarity bound for fields which saturate the unitarity bound being free. <clears throat> but in particular, for any conformal field theory, it tells you that the mutual information cannot go down faster in a conformal field theory than this power of the distance cannot go to zero faster than this. And this number is just for a free scalar. Um, um, um well this this was about uh, this calculation of the mutual information uh, only taking about, uh, into account uh, the inequalities um <clears throat> but then you can you can think well what happens if i use quantum field theory to understand what happens is at, at, at large distances at long distances and then you can compute you can try to compute um the behavior of the mutual information at long distances. And for that, <clears throat> you can uh, use this, uh, this uh, thing that is called the replica trick. And again, I will, I will talk about these quantities that are integer powers of, uh, traces of integer powers of the density matrix. Um, and the idea is, is to compute these things in, in the long distance expansion and then uh, do the, uh, analytic continuation in n to n equal to one to get the entropies. Um, this uh, for the integer n, as I said before, the, you have the nice thing that this, uh, this, these uh, quantities are expectation values of operators located in A and B. These are the goal, the, the twist operators, rangy twist operators. And you can think they are just the usual twist operators or Doppler long operators corresponding to the, to the symmetry of the theory. And here we have a, the a theory that is just n copies of the original one, independent copies. So it's just a theory which has trivially a permuta cyclic permutation symmetry between the copies. And then this naturally gives you the, some operators that implement this symmetry, but only locally in some region, A and B. Of course, uh, I'm taking here the limit where these A and B are sharp regions. So they are really limits of operators. But uh, as I said before, this doesn't matter for the mutual range entropies where these things are canceled. And it was the idea of Cardi that uh, as these are operators, and then you take the long distance limit, you can expand these operators in terms of local operators in the conformal field theory in, in an operator product expansion uh, sort of way, where you expand with some coefficients and some operators. But of course, here we are in a theory that is replicated n times. So these operators are operators 
which uh, live in this replicated theory. So they have products of operators in different copies of the theory. So you can, you can take your operators in one theory and make arbitrary co uh, products of operators in, in the different copies and obtain new operators in the full theory. And it was computed by Agon and Faulkner. Uh, the coefficients of the mutual information for a sphere can be computed following this method. The idea is that um, you take now, you take this expansion, you insert it here, and then it's just an expansion with some coefficients uh, of correlators, usual correlators of the theories in, 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 the, in the two regions. And then you, you, you have this for uh, any n, for any n, and it's, the, the, it, it turns out that the uh, leading contribution comes from two operators, two primary operators in two copies. You need more than one copy to have a non-zero result. And uh, if for two operators in two copies, and you, um, um, so it, it, turns out, it, it turns out to be proportional to the correlator square of the lowest dimensional operator, this gives you the leading contribution. Um, and uh, in our paper with Gonzalo Torro and Eduardo Deste, we, we computed this coefficient for the mutual information in terms of the modular flows uh, of uh, the regions A and B. Uh, the modular flows for people that is not in, in the subject is just, uh, you take the density matrix and evolve uh, some operator uh, uh, thinking in, in imaginary powers of the density matrix. So this gives you a unitary flow inside the, the algebra A, let's say. So um, the idea is that it, uh, it, the idea is that to take these these expansions and test them with some other operators, these operators here, in order to extract the coefficients. And then you have to do the analytic continuation and the analytic continuation give you uh, this formula that uh, you have to take correlators. This is a, it's an integral of, of over S, which is a modular parameter. It's, 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 this, it's related to this tau here. And this uh, is a modular evolved operator in the region A. And this is a modular evolved operator in the region B. You take this integral and um, take the limits where these two test operators are very far away from, from A and from B. And you get, uh, with that, you can, you can obtain the coefficient. So um, uh, in general, in general, this formula is difficult to apply because we don't understand very well what are the modular flows of the region A and B. But for a sphere, we have a hipster longo modular flow. Um, and then you can use this formula, insert there, and get, uh, get the result. And it, it turns out that the general result for any contribution coming from a primary field of some specific spin is given by this formula, where this coefficient has only depends on the dimension of the fields. This is a power. Um, falling again with the dimension of the, of the field. And then you have a, a term coming from the spin and it's just um, the trace of the spin representation of some particular Lorentz um, Lorentz uh, matrix that uh, comes from the geometry from the, of the boosted spheres. Um, and then, so the formula, only depends on the dimension of the field and the spin. It doesn't depend on the theory itself. So there are no um, three-point coefficients, or operator product expansion coefficient in this formula. Uh, and the reason is that the modular flow is universal on one side, and the other is that only the two-point function of the field enters in, in, the, in the calculation because it's, a, it's a, the leading contribution. And these are some examples. For a scalar, you don't have any dependence on the boost of the theories. 
uh, for a fermion field, uh, you have uh, this boost parameter to the power one, and as you increase the, the, the spin, you have a vector field, you have a power two, and for a graviton, you have a power four. So you, you obtain more and more uh, powers of this uh, boost parameter. Uh, and a nice result is that for spheres that are not boosted to each other, there are coplanar spheres. Uh, the result is very general and it's just this number that depends on the dimension and then the dimension of the Lorentz representation. It's just the only things that change is there. Um, sorry. Um, well, <clears throat> Uh, let, let us see then what happens with uh, with free fields. So primary fields that can produce this uh, leading contribution can be free uh, for any dimension for scalars and fermion fields, Dirac fermion in any dimension, plus um, uh, for even dimensions or fields with a, a specific di young diagram type in the, in the index of the spin, determined by the elicity of the field. And these are fields where, which have this structure, uh, which where H is the elicity and gives uh, the number of copies of these indices. And these are antisymmetric indices. For example, in, two, in four dimensions, you have the F mu nu for the Maxwell field. You have the, the curvature tensor for the free graviton. Uh, and this is antisymmetric in alpha beta and symmetric in, in gamma delta. And you, you can have more, more and more elicities. Uh, and for these free primaries, you have a, the dimension is given by this formula where H is the, the elicity. And then you can put this particular uh, uh, Jan, di Jan diagram type of fields and these particular dimensions in the formula for the mutual information uh, leading contribution, and you get this, which is an expansion again in powers of this um, boost parameter with some coefficient that you can compute. And it turns out that these exact coefficients are exactly the ones that saturate the inequality here. So the inequality is saturated exactly that a, a strong, a strong superadditivity inequality is saturated exactly for these particular coefficients that are for free fields. So <clears throat> it means that free fields exactly saturate the strong super, superadditivity inequality in the long distance limit. <clears throat> and the bound that it provides, it, 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 this inequality provides a bound on delta, is exactly saturates for, uh, for free fields. So it gives you. Um, for this type of fields with the particular tensor structure, it gives you the unitarity bound. However, for other fields with other tensor structure, the bounds that you obtain for the, from the inequality of the strong superadditivity is suboptimal, is not uh, as, as strong as the unitarity bound. You cannot have that from, from this idea. And you can see that there are reasons for the fact that this inequality saturates for free fields. The idea is that um, what, we, what we call the pinching property of the mutual information, um, the idea is that if you have a mutual information of some, some region like this uh, double cone with some other region that we can fix a, a far away, and you start deforming this double cone, just making a a slit here, you, you take away some piece of the Cauchy horizon in such a way that in the limit, you take a, somehow a region near a, a full segment of the horizon. When you do this limit, the, the volume of the, of the causal region here tends to zero because re, null rays can enter through this slit. Uh, so it, it, the volume tends to zero while the surface is still there. So if you have a free theory, uh, you can write down your fields in the null surface, you can localize your algebra in the null surface, and then the mutual information doesn't suffer any great change in the limit. However, if the, field, if the fields are interacting, the dimension is not exactly free, 
you, you cannot localize the, your operators in the null surface. And then it means that the algebra has to go to zero when, when, you, go, when you do this, this type of thing. So it means that uh, in the limit, the, the mutual information will go to zero. There is no algebra to, to have any mutual information. So the fact that, so somehow this pincher property defines in an entropic way what, what a free theory is. It's a, it's a free theory, not a generalized free field, but a free, a free one with the dimension of a free field. Uh, this is on one side. On, on the other side, you can think what happens if I think um, a strong superadditivity saturates. And then you can prove that the strong superadditivity super, uh, saturates. Uh, it means that this functional uh, mutual information is a function of the curve here, of the region. Is a, is a local on this region. It means it's a kind of integral uh, on the boundary of the region. So it means automatically that if you saturate the strong superadditivity as, as it is an integral, if you deform only in a null ray, it will not change much. So it means that it can only saturate for something that is non-pinching, so it's something that is free. And this is the reason why it saturates only for free fields. And you can also see that um, because of this formula, why is that uh, the long distance limit uh, saturates only for free fields? It, it's the fact that um, um, if you have a free field, you can write it as a, as a linear combination on the null rise on the null rise of the uh, on the on the null cone, for example, the null cone of A or the null cone of B, and then in that case. Um, uh, we know that the modular flow for any region with boundary in a null cone is local on each of the null lines. So, uh, so it means that it's local on, on, on the null rays here. And then the cont these contributions are B local on A and B. And it means that the, the coefficient of the mutual information will be also B local and will be. Um, will saturate the inequality, the inequality of the strong superadditivity. <clears throat> then I, I will, I will then. So what we say with this is that there is something that we we take it as um as something uh, negative in the sense that we can use this inequalities for mutual information to produce some unitarity bounds, but not all unitarity bounds that you expect to have. And it's difficult to understand how to go on for other bounds because the, these bounds are naturally, naturally saturated for something that is free. Um, well, I, then I change subject and then I will talk about this extensive mutual information model. And the idea is that uh, to produce a model for the mutual information that satisfies all the conditions that we know and test it, this is a quantum field theory or it is not. To, in order to, to understand if our actions are somehow incomplete. And it, there is a, a, a well-known model from some years ago uh, that, um, uh, you, you can produce by imposing this condition that the tripartite information, this combination is always zero. In that case, there is a unique solution, except for a multiplicative constant that give you the mutual information of two regions in a conformal field theory as an integral over Cauchy surfaces of the two theories. Or you can write this exactly in, 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 in this other way as a, as a as a B local thing in the, in the two boundaries of the two regions with this coefficient. And this uh, satisfies all the constraints we know of the mutual information. And in particular, in two dimensions, it coincides with the mutual information of a free fermion. It's a, this formula for the free fermion is exactly this formula applied in two dimensions. Then the question is what happens in more dimensions? In more dimensions, uh, 
we do not know if it is a, a theory or not. It comes, it comes from a theory or not. So we can, in tropic bootstrap, let's say, try to understand if this formula gives you uh, conformal dimensions of operator, et cetera, and try to understand if this is compatible with the quantum field theory or not. So <clears throat> the first things you can do is to take uh, two spheres, compute this EMI, a, 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 EMI model, uh, mutual information that is just an integral, double integral, and then you compute the long distance limit. Uh, you get this, this thing here for the long distance limit for two boosted spheres. And you compare this with the scalar and uh, with a, a fermion, for example. And you can see from this formula, you can, you can uh, uh, already obtain <clears throat> the, the leading uh, conformal dimension because of the power here. And you can uh, compare in the, the tensor structure, you can see that it's if, if the AMI model is a quantum field theory, it has to have a free fermion as the lowest dimensional operator. However, so in two dimensions, it's exactly a free fermion. In higher dimension, it's not a free fermion. In particular, in three dimension, for example, you can compute other things from the, from the, from the EMI model, and you can see that it doesn't match the free fermion. Uh, here I'm taking some coefficients, for example, constant term of the sphere. Uh, this k is the is the area coefficient in the area law when the mutual information diverges in two regions touch each other. And for the MI, this gives you pi, and for the fermion is near pi. And you can also compute the coefficient of the stress tensor correlator, just deforming the mutual information of uh, the, of, of the slightly deformed spheres. And you can also see that it looks like the EMI, it looks like the, the free fermion, but it doesn't, it, it isn't. So they, this idea of entropic bootstrapping, the, the thing is that you compute the mutual information and then it, it is expected, it has a expansion in the conformal blocks. These conformal blocks are produced by operators in the replicated theory together with all the descendants of each operator in the replicated theory. For example, we have seen that the leading term for a free fermion is dominated by two fermions in two copies. In fact, this is operator in the replicated theory that uh, dominates the mutual information at long distances. is a, a two copy operator current by, by free fermion in two copies in the range in the replica method. <clears throat> And this then has a, is a current, it has a spin one, it has dimension D minus one in, in D dimensions. It gives a contribution to the mutual information when, once you add all the um, subleading um, um, descendant operators, is a, a contribution that is proportional to um, the, the conform this conformal block. And then the idea is, as you know that is you have this you can you can you can subtract it and see what other conformal blocks you have and the surprise that when you do that for the M emi model you get that it's exactly it's exactly equal to this to this conformal block so it means that in two dimensions for the other operators in the replicated theory that are not this one there are miraculous cancellations in the contribution from the multi-copy operators, uh, but these cancellations do not occur in four dimension greater than two, because in two dimension, the AMI is exactly equal to this, and it's exactly equal to the free fermion. So the free fermion also has only one term in this expansion. In higher dimension, it's not, it's not the case. So the idea is that you have a free fermion, inside the EMI model, then you expect to have other contributions, subleading contribution, and the next one is produced by this operator that is a primary operator in the replicated theory, uh, but it contains derivative of one of the operators in each copy. And you can compute the contribution along distances of this operator. And uh, and you can see that you cannot cancel this contribution by any primary operator uh, um, 
<clears throat> that you can add to the EMI model. So you can, you can say the EMI model is a free fermion plus something else that will cancel the other contribution. And uh, for all dimension, it cannot be canceled. And for even dimension, there is, um, there is a contribution that, that for example, for a, a free uh, elicity one field that is exactly proportional to this thing. So you can think you can add to the EMI model the free fermion, and you, you also have another sector, um, uh, um, in particular containing at least the one field. And it turns out that this implies that the mutual information in the EMI model has to be greater than the one of the fermion, right? And if it contains, um, if, if it contains also at least the one field, that cancel this other contribution, it should be that the EMI model is the free fermion one plus the elicity one field plus something else. So it has to be greater than this, com this combination. Uh, and you can check computing now, not long distance limits, but a short distance limit in the coefficient of the area term, you can check that this, this is not obeyed. This inequality that the EMI model has a greater entropy than the fermion plus something else is not obey. So it, it, it means that the AMI model cannot be a conformal field theory for dimension greater than two. Another thing that you can check is the EMI model, for example, at large di at long distances, you, it's, a, it's a simple integral in the, in the long distance is proportional to the product of volumes for regions that are, are not spheres for any kind of region. And you can compute exactly for the free fermion, um, the case, for example, where you don't have a spheres, you have like thin plates in the long distance limit using like, uh, the resolvent. And then you can compare if the coefficient for plates is equal to the one of the spheres as the EMI model suggests. And is, this is not the case. For example, in dimension three is 0 0.771, it's not, it's not one. So it means the EMI model is not given uh, any entropy for, um, for, for dimension greater than two. So, <clears throat> so in, then as in conclusion of, of, of all this investigation, the list of entropy axiom, axioms that we know is incomplete because it has solutions that are not coming from quantum field theory. So uh, the question that remains is what new axioms would eliminate, for example, naturally this, this as, as a model for dimension greater than two? Um, what kind of axioms will give a uh, unitary bounds for other tensor structures for different primary fields, which uh, do not saturate for, for, for free field in the case of free fields. Um, we also know, we also need uh, other, in, other different inequalities for irreversibility, proving irreversibility theories for greater uh, dimension greater than, than four. And another question is, what about if we don't think about the entropy and we think about the range entropies uh, with the integer index? Um, the question is, how much can be reconstructed uh, from the range entropies of the, of the original theory? In particular, you can play the game of, of uh, computing these uh, range entropies for all n or, or, or even, um, or even taking other twist operators that are not uh, symmetric, um, um, permutation symmetric uh, op twist operators and try to, to reconstruct from there. So this is, this is a perhaps more promising idea, but it's not uh, developed yet. And as a final commentary, <clears throat> one, as I said, somehow we need more inequalities. Strong subjectivity is not enough because um, it's suggested that you, you need a, like a, an infinite tower of inequalities um, to reconstruct the Hilbert space because it, you, you need them. 
Um, so it would be very nice to have more inequalities for the entropy, uh, but the simplest idea that you can have is it doesn't work. What, what is this simple idea is that you have the inequalities for range entropies for integer index. So these are infinitely many inequalities for each n. Um, and then you can say, well, what if I take the limit n equal to one, uh, brute force in these inequalities? Of course, you cannot do that for inequalities, but let us see. And, and then you get uh, this n is equal to one. So if this is a small number. This is a small number. And you can expand in Taylor. And what you get is an infinite series of inequalities for the mutual information now, which are polynomial rather than exponential here. These are polynomial. But you can see that they do not hold, for example, for holographic models. You can put the mutual information for holographic model, and they, they it, 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 it does hold for many cases. Uh, but in some particular uh, particular configuration, you can see that it uh, do not hold. And it's natural to think that this type of infinitely many inequality will not hold on holographic theories, at least generally, because when you when you take all your regions very near to each other, this will produce inequalities in higher derivatives than two in the in the entropies. What means is a, is, is a tower of inequalities with large derivatives for the minimal uh, areas that give the entanglement entropy in the holographic context. And as these minimal areas are made second order equations of minimizing surfaces is very difficult to get um, to get that this this is uh, possible so somehow holographic theory still tell you that it's not easy to really have a, a, a tower for the entropy uh, ironically however this this infinitely many inequalities do hold for this emmy model which is not the mutual information of a quantum field theory <laughs> it's strange, but it's, it's because, in fact, if you see this ME model can be, can be thought as a logarithm of uh, correlators rather than mutual information. Well, I think I, I have finished. Thank you. Yes, sorry, there are questions or comments. Yo? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yeah, yes. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I would like to ask you uh, uh, the comment at some point, if you said that um, only free field theory can be restricted to the null plane. Uh, is it correct? And if so, why can you? Yeah, say that? yeah. yeah. This is this is my strong belief. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you can. Th there are old papers talking about that. Uh, you you have to uh, take a field and then uh, a smear. And then you, you have to take the support of this smear function, um, for example, in a null plane, and, uh, and compute, for example, the correlator square of this smear function, of, of smear field. And you can see that this diverges uh, if the field is, is not free. So you have to have a, um, the two point function has to be a non. You know, and not not too much uh, singular as in the case of interacting theory, so it has to, in, in fact imposes that it's free. So only only some components, the, the in fact derivatives of of the free field along the direction of the null rays survive uh, um, survive uh, the the smearing only in the null plane. I had a question about the bootstrap 
Uh, so of course, the conformal bootstrap is very successful. Um, also there, and it's not so clear that it's um, a complete set of axioms, although perhaps more so. Uh, why is the, the, is the entropic bootstrap apparently less successful? What, what is the crucial difference? Uh, well, I would say that, uh, um, first of all, we don't understand, um, it seems that the, the, for the entropy, you should know more constraints. Um, um, uh, may, maybe you are asking, uh, so we, we don't have uh, some, you, you are asking how to build models about, uh, using this? Well, we don't know really. I'm not sure but what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hope is that once you have a, once you have a set of axioms for the entropy, you can try to understand how to invent models that uh, that uh, will uh, will give solutions of that. Uh, but of course, we don't have a um, we we don't have the, the the full set of axioms yet. You you can say that something like like a full set of axioms you you. You can have uh, for the rangy case, for the rangy entropies, um, but then, then I would say it's, 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 it's the same kind of stuff. It's not developed, but I, I would expect that you can arrive to the same kind of stuff as in the Wigman reconstruction theorem, that is not really um, giving you any solution, right? But it, it allows you to think, uh, for example, instead of algebra, think about this particular kind of correlators of range or range correlators, let's say. Uh, and, and the hope is that it, it gives you a, a simplest, a simple, a simpler uh, description, right? Yeah, so, so what I meant more, I mean, in, you cannot reconstruct the theory from the Weichmann axioms, but from the axioms of conformal field theory there, you have also the crossing symmetry, which seems yeah. in combination with positivity seems very efficient at constraining particular theories like the easing model and yeah. dimensions and so on. So is your view that some axiom of this sort is maybe missing still or like the crossing? Perhaps, symmetry? perhaps something that, well, it's interesting, for example, what you say, because in the Weimann actions, you have infinitely many inequalities, right? Um, and this bootstrap thing, it has only these deltas are positive right? or have this unitarity bound. And you will say, well, uh, but, but this is two point, two point function, right? What, what happens with the inequalities, infinity tower inequalities for other uh, multi point functions? And well, they are somehow produced by this uh, unitarity bounds plus these other constraints that you mentioned. Um, so uh, it somehow we simplify the, the, the part of the inequalities, it, it simplifies this, uh, um, uh, these crossing symmetries. And, and then, yeah, perhaps this is a, a good thing to, to, to think about. Uh, instead of thinking of more inequalities, thinking what, what would, uh, the crossing inequalities would mean in this context. Yeah, it's a nice thing. I haven't thought about that. Further questions? Arthur? I'm sorry, I came a little late and maybe you've answered this question, but where does the Markov property come from? Is that an assumption or is that something coming out of the entropy? Uh, yeah, well, I have some transparency here showing the, the idea. It's not mathematically proved because we are not mathematicians, but we are confident that it's correct. The idea is that you have a, and you have, you can compute this holographically and see that it holds. Uh, you have this, uh, for example, in a, you have a, a curve in the null plane determining a whole volume of a space time. And you can think, well, if I put a regulator 
but it's a Lorentz invariant regulator. I have some entropy that is a function of this curve, gamma. And then you can apply boosts and squeeze this thing to, to, the, to this uh, Rindler line, let's say. So it means that these entropies are all the same because it's symmetry, just a symmetry. And then you apply a strong superadditive inequality and as all the entropies are the same, for example, in this situation, then you get zero. So you get saturation of strong superadditivity for regions on a null plane. Then you can conformally map to boundaries in a null cone in a conformal case. Um, and you can also say the same things, for example, that the, the modular flow of, instead of the Rindler, that is a boost uh, here of, of, of a sphere, push your regions to the boundary. And then the, all the, all the if you have a, a something like this that doesn't have divergence because the boundaries appear in all the, appear in A and the intersection in the union, so it cancels the divergences, your statement, must be correct somehow that this is a true property. So this is what we call the Markov property. It's just, it's just the cancellation or the saturation of strong superadditivity for regions in a conformal field theory in an, in, with boundary in a null cone. Uh, there is also um, an argument based on these um, half-sided modular inclusions by Borges and Wilfrock. Um, that somehow you, you take the null cone and then um, uh, you take, uh, you, you, you know there uh, how the modular flow acts for any sphere, any boosted sphere. And so with that, you can try to using the, this um, uh, half sided modular inclusion, try to uh, see how other shapes, other shapes like this one, this is a picture of the null, of the null cone, let's say, and I'm flattening it. How this, this, uh, these regions act on other regions like this parabolas that are coming from, uh, from intersection with the spheres. Um, so, and you can, you can see that you have enough regions that where you know the modal flow to try to reconstruct the full uh, geometric action of any, of any of these regions. And it will always act in the same way that is in each null line, it acts like the usual modular flow for spheres. So it, it, it really acts null line by null line in the same way. So it means that uh, somehow you can heuristically think that uh, thinking in a null, in a region with boundary in a null cone, your density matrix is like a tensor product over different null lines. This is kind of correct for a free field where you can really put the field on the null surface, but it's of course just a heuristic thing for interactive theories. But we think uh, this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, really holds. Further questions? Okay. So if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. So now it's coffee break and